Monsters are everywhere. Under our beds, in our closets, lurking in the dark, and ever present in our nightmares. But how unique are these monsters? And what makes up a good demon? We'll take you on a journey through 2500 years of monster design and show you that our demons actually haven't changed that much. Stories of monsters and demons are as old as time and can probably best be explained because we've always feared the unknown. And Greek mythology gives us the first elaborate visual representation of monster and demon designs. What stands out is that most of them are hybrid creatures, which means they're human and animal combined in one body. Often, the more animal-like the monster, the more demonic it was supposed to be. It appears that the ancient Greeks had a clear moral in their design, which later artists build upon as well. Humans are as close to divine creatures as you can get. Animals, however, represent immorality, lust, and the overall demonic behavior. This explains why the ancient Greek gods more resembled the human form. One of the most iconic creatures from Greek mythology is the satyr. Their goat-like characteristics, their horns, legs, and hooves, have since become symbolic for all things demonic, even in our present time. It was such a strong image that the Catholic Church adopted these features for the devil himself. And we continue to see this design over and over in our movies. One of the satyr's leading figures was Pan. Although he was the god of sheep herders and the forests, he is best known for chasing nymphs around. Driven by his sexual desires and scaring sheep herders with his grunts and low noises. This is where the word panic originates from. It's derived from Pan himself. This all leads us to arguably one of the best monster designers of our time, Guillermo del Toro. His 2006 masterpiece, Pan's Labyrinth, is clearly inspired by Greek mythology. Although del Toro himself actually stated that the font in his film is not the Greek mythological figure Pan, the goat-like design and the title of the film is linked directly to two and a half thousand years of history. Artists throughout the ages all followed upon Greek mythological monster design. In the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, we see a large quantity of demonic creatures in the visual arts. It's important to understand that we're discussing this subject from a modern perspective and that the criteria for what's made up and what's genuinely believed has changed over time. The medieval bestiary tradition of the Middle Ages is probably the best example of this. Bestiaries can be described as early encyclopedias containing all known animals of the time. But in these bestiaries you'll find depictions of mythological animals and monsters as well described as if they're as real as any other being in the animal kingdom. The main goal of these bestiaries was the promotion of religious and moral values. As an effect of the popularity of these books, people in the Middle Ages started to find all sorts of proof of the existence of mythological animals and demons. Like these unicorn horns, which were only found on the beaches on the shores of the northern seas, which is quite an odd place for unicorns to hang out. In reality, these horns turn out to be the tusks of the not-so-mythical narwhal. The mythological animals in these bestiaries can for a large part be traced back to Greek mythology. However, many of these creatures have their roots in the actual animal kingdom. As many exotic animals to the west were seldom seen in real life, they were often misinterpreted it's said that the medieval dragon is actually a misinterpretation of a boa constrictor. And when looking at early depictions of dragons and bestiaries, you can see the resemblance. Over time, the appearance of the dragon has changed to the dragons we know from Game of Thrones, for example. It appears that the creators of Game of Thrones got their inspiration almost directly from the visual culture of the Middle Ages. The dragons, hybrid creatures and even the mythical Kraken, they all can be traced back to the medieval folklore. 
In medieval and renaissance art, monsters and demons were abundant and linked to stories from the Old and New Testament. And again, in their design, we see the same characteristics as before. Weird mixed creatures that should warn the viewer to control their animal-like impulses. Although the scientific revolution of the following centuries condemned most of these monsters and demons to the realms of fantasy, their visual nature was already imprinted in our collective memory. There's one more popular element of monster design that we would like to point out. Deformation. Extremely deformed creatures with limbs and eyes in the weirdest places. Take the Blemius, for example, which were described as lacking a head with a face placed on their torso and in medieval times were believed to live somewhere in Africa. This element of monster design is still very popular. One of the most iconic examples of our time comes again from Guillermo del Toro's masterpiece Pan's Labyrinth, the Pill Man. His eyes are embedded in the palms of his hands and his fingertips resemble eyelashes. The Pill Man is linked not only to Western mythology and folklore, but also to the Japanese stories of Tonomi, which literally means eyes in hands. This is what Del Toro has to say about his use of monsters. I think, I think that I'm interested in monsters not because they have a specific value, you know, I actually think they are uh, they have multiple values depending on how you use them. They are uh, uh, symbols of great uh, power. I think that uh, at some point when we became thinking uh, creatures, we decided to interpret the world uh, by creating a mythology of gods and monsters. You know, we created angels, we created demons, we created uh, serpents devouring the moon. We created a mythology to, to make sense of the world around us. And monsters were born at the same time than angels or any of the beatific uh, uh, creatures and characters were created. So I don't assign them a specific value, uh, but I do. I am very mindful of the way I deal with them in the movies uh, and in the books because uh, I assign them a, a specific function and I try to take them to the extreme with that. You know, I make them victims or I make them sympathetic or I make them brutal parasites and they become a metaphor for something else. Obviously, monsters are living, breathing metaphors that for me, half of the fun is explaining them so socially, biologically, mythologically and so forth. It isn't that hard to understand why movie directors reuse the same monsters and demons of our past. As a society, we've learned to fear them over a period of 2,500 years and they've proven to be quite effective. Or, as Del Toro says himself, the first glance of the monster should tell you its story, purpose and what it represents. So next time you have a nightmare, analyze your demons. Chances are that it's just the ancient Greeks messing with your mind again. But what do you think? Is this art? Let us know in the comments whether you think monsters can be art or not and let us know your suggestions for future episodes of Is This Art. Thanks for watching.